So, let us continue our discussion on theory of probability. Uh, as we mentioned in the last class that uh, we will review the relevant mathematical models that we are going to use for reliability based structural design. So, uh, let us consider uh, design examples and using that examples we will further continue in our discussion. So, we have a cantilever beam as you can see on your screen. This beam is exposed to a point load at the free end and the material as well as sectional properties also the geometry the length of this beam these parameters are given. Now, we design these kind of structures in civil engineering and other engineering also. Now, in design we use certain limit states or performance function. Now, these limit states are of different types either based on stress or forces or based on displacements. As you can see in this case, our performance function is actually based on the displacement and because this is a cantilever beam experiencing a point load at the free end, obviously the deformation will be maximum at the free end and therefore, the performance function we have is also based on the deformation at the free end. Now, in a, any design problem, we normally expect the beam to deform because this is an elastic structure and hence there is a limit to which we can safely deform the beam. As you can see in this case, this delta allowable, the first parameter on the right hand side is the allowable deformation that anyway the beam will experience and if it experience that much of deformation, it will not cause any trouble and hence we can ensure safety. Now, the moment we apply a point load at the free end, we can solve this structure using structural analysis and then we can find out what is the deformation and in this case we know it is P L cube by 3 E i. So, the performance function in this case we have is delta allowable minus P L cube by 3 E i. Now, when this is equal to 0, that means the externally applied load causing a deformation which is just meeting the allowable requirement. If it crosses that limit, obviously the structure fails. Now, here I should mention one thing that failure does not necessarily means collapse. In this case, failure means crossing this allowable limit for deformation. Now, as you can see in this problem, we have different parameters, for example, load geometry, material property and then sectional details. Now, all these parameters can experience uncertainty. To start with a simple problem, let us consider only the load in this case is having some randomness. The moment we consider the load to be random following the definition we have already discussed then for every possibility of this load, the value of this limit state will also vary. It can be greater than the allowable deformation, it can be exactly same or it can be less than the allowable deformation depending upon the value, the outcome of this random parameter p. Now, at the beginning we define this problem, we define the problem means we identify load that is p in this case as a random variable. The moment we consider p as a random variable and all other parameters are deterministically defined, that means they have fixed values, they cannot differ. Then we need to define the probability distribution. In this case, load can continuously vary and therefore, the underlying PDF we have to specify to completely define the problem. Now, once the problem is defined, of course, the next question is what is the PDF of this limit state? Because if we can quantify that, then we can certainly fix the limits and then based on that limit, we can identify the probability of failure. So, the first step in this case is to find out the PDF that governs the 
uncertainty associated with this limit state, which is originated from the input in this case the load p. So, if I write down the problem statement, we have a set of random variables. Let us start with a single random variable first, which is defined by x. We have another random variable y, which is a function of x. Now, in that case, the question is if we know the PDF of x, can we find out the PDF of y? So, that the, the question that we are going to answer. Before we write down the mathematical model, let us graphically understand the problem statement and then we will step by step write down the mathematical model involved in it. So, we have a polynomial function as you can see on your screen y equal to g x. It may be any function for that matter, where x is the random variable at the input and we know in some functional form how the y is related to x. Not only that, we also know the PDF of x. So, as x varies, this is the relative frequency of occurrence. So, the distribution of relative frequency of occurrence, we call it PDF. This information is known to us. What we are going to find out is that for all possible y, as we vary here, what is the PDF of y? That means, what is the distribution of relative frequency of occurrence? Now, the problem statement can be graphically shown here that for all possible y, if we can find out what is the area under the PDF of x, as you can see, we just draw two horizontal lines having a differential width and then we drop this vertical lines to see how many areas that we have under the PDF of x. So, you can see for one y, we have three possibilities of x in this case, at least that is what the graphical representation shows. It can be any number depending upon the shape of this green line. Then we can also identify what is the area under the PDF of y. Now, if we slide these two horizontal line vertically up and down, then what will happen? It will actually cover the complete area under the PDF of x. At the same time, this horizontal line will also cover the complete area under the PDF of y. Now, we know from the definition the area under the PDF is 1 and that is only possible when the area under the PDF of x is equal to the area under the PDF of y. That means, if we sum up these three segments under the PDF of x, that summation will be exactly equal to the area under the PDF of y. So, in principle what we do? We equate the area under the two PDFs. So, let us write down the mathematical model for that. So, what we have? We have y equal to g x and then what we wish to find out f y of y, that means probability of y star, any outcome is less than y, which is in other words g x is less than y. Now, we find out the area under the PDF of y, that means this horizontally marked area. Then we equate that area, that means p y of y times d y, that is the differential element we consider, is equal to the 3 shaded region under the p x of x. So, we have p x of x 1 times d x 1 plus p x of x 2 dx2 and px of x3 dx3. So, obviously, we have py of y, if we just simplify the previous expression, we get this nice expression, where we have px of x evaluated at all xi. In this case, we have three possibilities for a given y and hence we have summation over three different components. 
that divided by the slope dy dx evaluated at the ith point. So, this gives us a general form of p y of y that we can find out from the variable at the input in this case p x of x. The only extra information we need in this case is the slope at that point where we have y equal to g x. Now, here you can notice we introduce this modulus that means, we consider the positive slope only. The reason behind that is the probability distribution function or cumulative distribution function it is a monotonically increasing function and that is the reason we consider only the positive slope. Otherwise, the capital PDF or capital CDF may decrease which uh, is against the nature of PDF or CDF. So, this model gives us clear idea how we can actually find out the distribution of y which is a function of some known random variable x. Now, obviously, this is in one dimension as we move further we will also consider multiple dimensions, but this model gives us a hope that yes if we can identify the performance function and also the random variables at the input, then we can at least quantify the uncertainty associated with the performance function. And the moment we can quantify the uncertainty associated with the performance function, we can also evaluate the probability. So, let us consider one more example. In this case, we have y which is g x, but this is an exponential function and the x which is a known random variable it follows normal distribution with mean mu x and standard deviation sigma x. Our objective is to find out what is the probability of capital Y. Again let us see graphically what does it mean. So, we have y as a function of x and the given information is f x of x that means p d f of x. What we have to find out is p d f of y. Again we follow the same logic what we do for every y we consider a differential element and then corresponding to that element we find out what is the area under the known variable in this case x and we equate that area with the variable at the output in this case y. So, if you follow that same logic we know that the input variable x which is normally distributed. So, the expression for normal distribution is known and that is on your screen. So, we have p x of x, then the logic goes the area under the two different probability distribution function will be equal and then we can find out p y of y. So, we have in this case y is equal to exponential of x. So, we can find out x is equal to log y and dy dx is nothing but y itself because it is an exponential function. So, from these two information and if you follow the model we can find out what is the p y of y and that is on your screen. Not only that if you recall what is the domain of normal distribution it is minus infinity to plus infinity and what is the transformation in this case exponential of x. Obviously, the domain of y will be from 0 to positive infinity. Now, if you look at this function this is nothing but the distribution that we call it log normal. So, y follows log normal distribution which is obvious because as per definition if x is normal obviously exponential of x will follow log normal distribution. So, with that let us solve the design problem and let us investigate how it goes. So, we have again the same cantilever beam in this case e i and l is given and we have a load which is following normal distribution the mean load is 30 and standard deviation is 2 with appropriate unit in kilo Newton. Then what we wish to find out the probability of failure against an allowable deflection of 11 millimeter. So, to start with 
the deformation at the free end that is the maximum deformation is p l cube by 3 i. So, we have p is equal to 3 i by l cube times delta. Obviously, the first differential of delta with respect to p we can find out because we know in close form the input output relation and we also know the distribution of p. In this case, it is normally distributed. So, we can write down the expression. So, that is the distribution followed by p, it is normal distribution and we have a bell shaped curve and the model we have just discussed, we can find out what is the distribution of delta that is the deformation at the free end. So, if we put the relevant expressions, we get the p d f of delta is 3 i by l cube times the distribution of p. Now, if you plot this distribution, we can see it is on your screen, the blue line shows the p d f of delta for different values of this load p. Now, we have an allowable limit of 11 millimeter, which means so long the deformation at the free end is less than 11 millimeter, our structure is safe. As soon as it crosses that limit, we consider it to be a failure. So, what is the probability of failure? Obviously, it is the area under the right hand side of this blue line marked by this uh, vertical arrow at 11 millimeter is the probability of failure. So, if you figure out that is nothing but delta greater than the allowable deformation in this case 11 millimeter. So, this is equal to 1 that is the total area under this curve and then we integrate this p d f the blue line from minus infinity up to 11 and we subtract these two to get the probability of failure which is in this case 0 0.067. Now, we can also figure out what is the mean deformation in this case the mean is 10 millimeter and also the standard deviation in this case 0 0.67 millimeter. So, we completely solve this problem where the input output relation is defined through some structural analysis and we identify the random variable at the input and then we quantify the uncertainty at the output that helps us to quantify the probability of failure. Now, if we just consider the mean deformation of the beam corresponding to 30 kilo Newton, the mean deformation is obviously 10 millimeter and our allowable deformation is 11 millimeter. So, if we find out what is the ratio of these two, obviously it is always more than 1 and based on this principle, our conclusion is that if we design the beam against mean load, it will always experience a safe design. However, in reality because of the uncertainty, the deformation can cross the allowable limit and still we can have a finite probability of failure. So, with that let us move forward and move towards further properties of uh, p d f that is probability density function. So, we define the moments of a random variable as per definition the nth moment of a random variable you can see on your screen we define it small m representing m represents moment and the subscript n represents the order of the moment in this case nth order moment. So, this is as per definition we write capital E which I will define in a minute this is called expectation operator over because this is the nth moment we are going to find out x to the power n. It means x to the power n times the p d f of x integrated over the complete domain and for a continuous function, let us consider the domain to be from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, the nth moment as per definition is nothing but x to the power n times f x of x dx. Now, if we put a special case n equal to 1, so we will get the first moment which obviously in this case integration from minus infinity to plus infinity x to the power 1 times f x of x dx. Similarly, if we find out what is the second moment, obviously this is where n equal to 2, 
and we will get x square f x dx integrated over the complex term. And that way it continues, we can change the values of n uh, to 3, 4, 5 and we can find out the respective moment of the random variable. Now, if you look at this first two moment, they resemble with C g and moment of inertia in uh, that we are familiar with in engineering mechanics. It actually shows, the first moment shows the central tendency of the data and second moment shows the dispersion of the data. As we progress further, we will see. Now, we can take this moment with respect to a reference point. For example, if we take the mean as our reference point, then the moment we get, we call it central moment. So, obviously, as per definition, if we find out nth central moment, it will be expectation of x minus mu x, where mu x is the mean of the random variable x whole to the power n. So, this again as per definition, x minus mu x whole to the power n times f x of x dx integrated over the complete. So, this is the second, this is the central moment. Now, if you put n equal to 2, we get the second central moment, which we also call variance and square root of variance, we all know that is called standard deviation. Now, if we follow the same logic and extend it further, if we have a function g x, then expected value of g x as per definition is g x times the p d f of x. Please note, in this case, it is the p d f of x times d x integrated over minus infinity to plus infinity. So, that gives the moment of a function g x, which is defined by the random variable x, whose p d f is known to us. So, if we follow that same logic, we can find out third and fourth central moment. As per definition, obviously, third central moment will be x minus mu x to the power 3 that is multiplied with f x and d x integrated over the complete domain and the same logic follows for the fourth moment also. Now, the ratio of third moment to standard deviation, we call it skewness and the ratio of fourth central moment to the standard deviation, we call it uh, kurtosis and we know the values of these two parameters for normal distribution. Now, if we move further and study the properties of expectation operator E of x, then let us see what happens when we scale up the random variable with a scalar factor A and take the expectation. As per definition, this is a function which is defined by this expression A x. So, the moment of this the power is 1, obviously, it is the first moment. So, A x times the p d f of x and we integrate over the complete domain. Because A is a scalar, we can take it out of this integral and then what we get A times x f x d x. So, x f x d x integrated over the complete domain is the first moment. So, we have A times E x. So, this indicates that if we scale up the random variable and take the moment of that it is equal to the moment of that random variable and then scale it up by the same factor. Following similar logic, we can also prove that expectation of x plus a is nothing but e x plus a. a is a scalar factor here. So, as if we open this bracket, so expectation of operator acts over this x and a because a is a deterministic quantity. Obviously, if we take the expectation of that, it will come out as the same value. So, we have E x plus A. Similarly, if you have two random variables, say x and y, although we are yet to define uh, multidimensional random variables, which we will do uh, in the following classes. But for the time being, if we consider two random variables x and y, which are independent also, then x is defined by its underlying pdf. 
Similarly, y is also defined by its underlying PDF. So, if we take the expectation, obviously, it will be the summation of E x and E y. Similarly, also we can prove expectation of x times y is equal to E x times E y provided x and y are independent. So, let us continue the logic. So, as per definition expected value of g x we have already discussed. Now, if you have two different functions g 1 x and g 2 x then we can also prove that the expectation of this summation of these two functions will be nothing but the summation of these two functions g 1 and g 2 times because these two functions are defined by the same random variable x. So, summation of these two random variable times f x of x and then integrated over the complete domain. And if we simplify this expression, we get expected value of g 1 of x plus expected value of g 2 of x. Similarly, we can extend the logic for conditional cases also. We are yet to define that. Uh, we will come back to this expression just to see if what happens if x 1 and x 2 are independent. Then if we have expectation of x 1 given that x 2 takes the value of small x 2, then the expectation is given by the same logic. So, we have x 1 times the conditional PDF of x 1 given x 2 and then we integrate over d x 1 and because this is the case where x 1 and x 2 are independent obviously, if x 1 given x 2 is as good as f x 1 because it does not depend on the other variable. So, we ultimately get expected value of x 1. Now, we have already defined variance which is nothing but the second central moment. So, let us see, let us investigate the expression of variance. So, we have variance of x which is nothing but second central moment that means x minus mu x whole square times f x of t x. This symbolically represented expected value that is e within third bracket x minus mu x whole square and we know this is the square of the standard deviation. So, what is variance of x? If we expand the term x minus mu x whole square within the third bracket, we get expected value of x square minus twice x mu x plus mu x square. And then we have already seen that if we have a summation of functions, then obviously expectation operator sits over this individual component. So, in this case we have expected value of x square plus expected value of this complete expression 2 times x times mu x plus expected value of mu x square. Then if we further simplify we can see the second term having minus 2 times mu x this is a scalar multiplication of x. So, obviously, this scalar component will come out of the expectation. So, we have minus 2 mu x times e of x which is again mu x. So, in turn we have 2 times mu x square plus again the last term that is mu x square itself because mu x is a constant term if we take the expectation of that obviously, it will remain the same. So, mu x square expected value of that is also mu x square. Then further simplification gives us expected value of x square minus mu x square. So, we get the variance of x is nothing but expected value of x square minus mu x square. It shows that second moment of a random variable is nothing but the summation of the square of mu x and sigma x. So, if we evaluate mu x and sigma x from a data, we can easily find out what is the second moment and obviously, uh, we can also figure out second central moment. Now, if we consider the variance of a constant, obviously, in this case variance of a, a having no uncertainty at associated with the with this variable, obviously, the variance of this quantity will be 0. We can also prove it, but it is quite natural that uh, variance of a constant is always 0. Similarly, variance of a times x will be a square 
times variance of x. And the logic goes a plus b x variance of that will be because variance of a is 0, it will have b square times variance of x. So, with that let us solve one problem. So, we have a frame which is exposed to a lateral force and the lateral strength of this frame is defined by the PDF on your screen and then we wish to find out what is the mean lateral strength and the variance. So, if you follow the definition mean is nothing but the first moment. So, s times f s integrated over the complete domain. So, if we put the expression of f s of s and then simplify we basically get the mean strength of the beam. Similarly, variance is the second central moment and because the PDF is defined over a domain of 1 to 2 in this case. So, you integrate this expression second central moment over the limits 1 to 2 and then we can evaluate the variance. So, the moment we quantify the PDF and other parameters, we can also quantify the design in terms of probability of failure. Now, let us move further. As of now, we have studied two different mathematical models. The first one, if we have a function of a random variable and then if the PDF of that random variable is given, then we can find out what is the PDF of the output. For example, if you have z equal to g x, if we know the PDF of x, we can find out what is the PDF of z. And then we have studied uh, the algebra of variance and then we have derived different expressions which gives us the expression of moment from the given PDF. Now, uh, let us investigate further. If we have the case where we have say z is equal to g x, this type of problem very often we encounter in structural design, then our objective here is to find out the first two moments of z. Why only first two moment? Uh, that I will explain uh, later, but for the time being if we are interested only in the first two moments, then let us see whether we can take an alternate approach to find out these moments directly. So, what we adopt is if we have a function in this case g of x and if we consider a reference point with respect to that reference point, we can actually expand this function using Taylor series which is an infinite series. So, you can see on your screen if you have a function f x and we have a reference point a and then we can write down this complete infinite series which actually replicates f x. Now, it involves if you look at the first term which is the function evaluated at a, the second term x minus a times the coefficient is first differential of f x evaluated at a divided by factorial 1 and the same way all other terms in this infinite series are defined. Now, if we follow that logic and try to expand this z equal to g x, where we consider a as a mean of the random variable, we get a very nice expression that is on your screen. So, z is nothing but g mu that is the reference point in this case plus g prime mu by 1 factorial times x minus mu and that way it continues for the infinite series. Now, in Taylor series expansion, we can consider the number of terms, we can truncate that expression up to the term beyond which it will have some an error term. So, if we consider the first term only, which is an approximation, of course, an approximation with certain amount of error. But if we consider the first term, we can easily see that z is almost equal to g mu. Now, in this case, if we take the expectation of both side, on the left hand side we have e of z that is the first moment of z which we are trying to find out is equal to on the right hand side expected value of g mu. That means, the function g evaluated at mu. 
obviously g evaluated at mu will have a fixed value it is a deterministic quantity so expectation of that will also remain the same so we have the first moment of z obtained as g mu of course in this model we consider only the first term keeping in mind that there is a amount of error in this formulation so we get the first approximation of the first moment of the random variable z now if we follow the same logic and consider first two terms then what we have we have g of mu plus g prime of mu by 1 factorial times x minus mu so ultimately what we have g mu we have already derived this is mu of z that is the mean value of z plus g prime mu that means it is the slope of the function gx evaluated at x mu times x minus mu now if you simplify we take this mean on the left hand side we have z minus mu z and then if you square it up we get the expression on the right hand side the slope evaluated at mu times x minus mu whole square now if you take the expectation on either side obviously on the left hand side we have the second central moment so on the right hand side we have slope evaluated at x equal to mu the square of it which is again a deterministic quantity obviously it will come out of the expectation so we have x minus mu whole square and expectation of that times the first differential of gx evaluated at mu square so we get the variance of z which is defined on your screen we get it from the variance of x so we have evaluated the first moment we have evaluated the second central moment we have already discussed the relation between the second moment and second central moment so we can easily find out second moment using that expression so this taylor series approximation gives us an idea how to get the first two moments obviously with some approximation however at least it throws some light how to evaluate the first two moments of a random variable which is actually related to another random variable through some functional form as it was in this case gx so let us solve an example we have a simply supported beam experiencing a point load at the middle and then all other relevant properties like geometry sectional details and the material all are given these values are deterministic and the load acting on this beam is following normal distribution and the parameters of this load are also given so the problem statement says that find out the first two moments of deflection at the center so the central deflection which is again in this case the maximum deformation for a simply supported beam is pl cube by 4080 so you have delta that is the central deformation as a function of the input variable that is in this case the load then we can find out the first differential of this delta with respect to p and which is nothing but l cube by 4080 so if we use variance algebra then the first moment of delta that is mu of delta is approximately equal to the functional form evaluated at the mean of the input random variable that means in this case it is p so evaluate the function p sorry function f where p takes its mean value so obviously mean of p times l cube divided by 4080 so if we just put the values numerical figures we get a mean deformation of 25 mm similarly if we find out what is the variance in this case variance of delta which is approximately equal to the first differential of delta with respect to p square of that evaluated at the mean point times variance of p now again if we put the numerical figures we get basically the standard deviation of delta is 3.125 mm now if we plot 
the distribution we know the mean and standard deviation. So, again in this case if you plot the distribution assuming it to be uh, normal which is also true in this case. So, we get a normal distribution this pink line where we have the mean deformation at 25 millimeter and we have already quantified the standard deviation. Now, if we set a limit a failure point that means an allowable delta in this case this vertical arrow and the vertical limit we set as L by 375 similar guidelines we often see in our code for serviceability. So, we use uh, an allowable deformation based on the geometry of this beam that is the span length and we get our allowable deformation is 26.67. So, the deformation more than the allowable deformation will actually cause failure. So, the probability associated with that we can easily evaluate and in this case we have a probability of failure of 0.2976. So, this example clearly tells us how to correlate the input uncertainty with the output and then quantify the PDF of the output and also we have an approximate model using Taylor series expansion to evaluate the first two moments and then the moment we quantify the uncertainty at the output we can also quantify the probability of failure which is more robust compared to factor of safety based design because this clearly gives you the idea how the failure is going to happen if at all it leads to failure. And uh, this mathematical framework tells us how we can shift our aim our focus from deterministic design to the uncertainty based structural design. With that let us close our discussion here in the next class we will continue on theory of probability. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.